Good morning. Uh, it warms my heart so much to see such a uh, uh, such a good crowd uh, to come out uh, for my friend Jim Gates. Last year, late last year, sometime after the historic announcement of the uh, observation of the Higgs uh, boson by two teams at uh, at CERN, a NIST colleague told me that we needed to get someone to come to NIST to tell us what the Higgs was all about. After years of media hype about the Higgs, it had finally arrived. But what is it, and why is it such a big deal? Having uh, experienced a few talks that purported to tell me that, uh, but that I didn't understand at all, I, um, <laughs> I, I thought very carefully about um, uh, who uh, should uh, uh, be asked to explain the Higgs uh, to a pedestrian experimentalist like myself. Um, and I thought carefully, uh, and it didn't take me too long before I uh, concluded that Jim Gates was the right person uh, for the job. Jim did his undergraduate and graduate work at MIT writing the first doctoral thesis there on supersymmetry. The University of Maryland captured him in 1984, and he's now the uh, John Toll Professor of Physics, as well as being the director of the Center for String and Particle Theory, and a Regents Professor of the University of Maryland system, which is the highest professorial honor that the entire Maryland system uh, awards its faculty. He serves his country as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and Jim is the recipient of many awards and honors for his work in scientific research and in bringing science to the public. Last month, the president awarded him the nation's highest scientific honor, the National Medal of Science. And I, here is uh, Jim with the president, uh, about to uh, have the president uh, hang that uh, uh, medal around uh, his neck. I was really pleased uh, with, with this award. I was also thrilled uh, to be at the White House for uh, that ceremony. Uh, that's what I saw from my perspective, off in the wings. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, Jim told the president a joke, uh, which the president found very funny. But apparently Jim's not revealing what that joke was. <laughs> um, we had a wonderful uh, time at the White House. We had a wonderful time at the uh, gala celebration. I convinced Jim and his family to pose for this picture in front of the, uh, the poster uh, for his National Medal of Science. Now you can't read the um, uh, the, 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 the citation, but let me read it for you, because it illustrates why I knew that Jim was the right guy for this job. So the citation reads, for contributions to the mathematics of supersymmetry in particle, field, and string theories. That's not what I asked him to, for. And extraordinary efforts to engage the public on the beauty and wonder of fundamental physics. Jim Gates. Bill, thank you for that kind invitation. Um, this is not my first time coming uh, out to NIST to give a presentation. And uh, there's someone in the audience that has actually been with me on a number of occasions when um, I presented. And first, it's also great, let me acknowledge all the wonderful friends uh, that I have not seen in a while, Catherine, for example, and uh, Kurt, and just uh, Marlon, and just so many other people out here at NIST that I've come uh, had our paths cross over the years, so it's great to be back. Um, but as I said, there's one person in the audience who uh, told a story once that I've never forgotten. And so we were sitting at an event very similar to this where I was to present, and uh, an introduction was going on. Uh, unfortunately, it was not as brief as Bill's. Uh, in fact, the, the introduction ruled on and on and on, and I started getting very nervous. I'm always nervous before I speak. This didn't help. And um, the person next to me leaned over and said, you know, 
we've all heard of a man that needs no introduction. <laughs> but that is an introduction that needs no man. <laughs> the person who made that comment is actually in the room today. I won't reveal his identity, but I will ask him later whether he remembers telling me that. I've never forgotten that. <laughs> So we're going to do a little review of the standard model. This is the first time I presented this talk, and so this was specifically designed for today's presentation. I'm sure I'll be giving the talk again. I've tried to throw in all the bells and whistles in the kitchen sink so that we can A, understand some physics, but B, also have some fun along the way. So let's start with the standard model. And the standard model is a collection of particles. And so you've probably seen this kind of representation before. We have the sets of quarks, up, char up down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. We have a set of leptons, that is particles that are very similar to the electron, the mu and the tau. And then there are things in nature that are like neutral electrons. We call them neutrinos. So this is part of what our species has been learning about for just over 100 years. And in fact, the first elementary particle was actually the electron. It was first theorized by an electrochemist by the name of J.G. Stoney, uh, who was trying to figure out how electroplating worked. And, and he had the idea that if there was something in nature smaller than an atom, he could understand why electroplating worked. And so he thought of this idea, first person to say, a chunk of matter smaller than the atom. And he also gave it a name. He called it the electron. So the electron was the first elementary particle, and it was known to us by at least one of us in our species by about 1870 or so. Uh, in addition, there are a set of objects that carry forces. So these objects are all subject to forces, but the forces are actually have carriers, which we call force particles or gauge particles. The photon is the for a carrier of the electromagnetic force. There are eight gluons, which carry the color chromodynamic force. They are the W and Z bosons. This is neutral. There's a plus and minus version of that, and they carry the uh, weak nuclear force. You will notice I'm not talking about gravity, which is also one of the fundamental forces. And the reason is because the standard model does not incorporate gravity into its description in a manner that's consistent with the laws of special relativity and quantum theory. So it's sort of on the outs. So all of these particles behave like spinning tops. Uh, we physicists have a number called h-bar, and we can measure the rate at which these particles spin in terms of h-bar. For, uh, for all of the matter par particles, which are called fermions, uh, this number j turns out to be 1 half. For all the force carriers, which we call boson, this number j turns out to be the number 1. So there's already a dichotomy in uh, the structure of the universe. Quarks appear in triplets in terms of uh, nuclear matter. You can either have triplets of quarks or you can have quark-anti-quark -quark pairs. The triplets are called hadrons. The quark-anti-quark -quark pairs are called mes mesons. And you can, by putting together different combinations, you get ordinary protons or antiprotons, neutrons, lambdas, omegas. And so you can sort of think of a hadron as a bag into which you throw quarks, and those collections are then nuclear matter. So here's a picture of a proton, or at least some sort of representation of a proton. By the way, uh, all of the images in my talk are allegories, and they're all backed up by equations. So rather than simply throw you page after page of equations, it's much simpler to show you the concepts behind the equations. One of the strange things about being a physicist is that we work a little bit like authors uh, of novels. You know, no novelists create characters and then tell stories with their characters. And in fact, if you speak to people who are novelists, sometimes they tell you things like, at a certain point, the character had a story to tell me, and it was my role to be the conduit of that story. That's exactly what we physicists do. We create mathematical novels with mathematical characters, and sometimes those characters come back and tell us stories that we didn't know were there when we began the novel. The story of antimatter, for example, is a very interesting example of that, where um, Dirac wanted to write an equation consistent with relativity and quantum theory, wrote an equation, and then because of that equation found that the electron had an evil twin called the positron. So it's an example of a character telling a story that you didn't know was there when you started writing it. So protons are dynamical things. So in this little cartoon, we're going to try to grab one of, the proton, uh, one of the quarks and pull it out. We can't quite manage it. And in fact, what we wind up afterwards is, in fact, two bits of nuclear matter where a, a quark and a quark pair was created in the process of trying to pull them apart. We don't believe you can ever pull quarks out of nuclear matter. <laughs> 
And we have a set of mathematics uh, that underlies uh, quantum chromodynamics, and that we believe that there's a phenomena known as infrared slavery, which is responsible for this permanent capture of quarks in the interior of nuclear matter. Um, if we're going to do some more physics, however, we take these objects uh, and arrange them in patterns. So each of these symbols you can think of as a wave function, if you're thinking of usual quantum mechanics. So let me take the, the quark wave functions for the up and down quarks, and also observe that quarks come in triplets. So let me arrange the up and down uh, wave functions in this manner. This L and R stands for left and right, and we'll come back to that later. I can do the same for the charm and strange quarks and for the top and bottom quarks. Now, the next thing we're going to do is not something that's obvious, because after all, we're just taking all these, pattern, these particles that we uh, saw and we're putting them in patterns in anticipation of doing some physics. Let me arrange the lepton so that we only have the neutrino and uh, an associated electron in a doublet, not in a two by three matrix, but in a one by two matrix. Same thing for the mu particle, same thing for the tau particle. Okay, and then finally, all the right-handed uh, leptons would just write separate wave functions. And now that's a very strange way to, to start taking things. It, look, it looks willy-nilly like we simply took the wave functions and threw them together in just an arbitrary fashion. But in fact, that's not the case. As we will see shortly, the, the arrangement of those patterns, in fact, is dictated by the forces that we see acting on these objects in nature. So how do forces act on these things? Well, we have something called the interaction paradigm. And the basic idea is we can imagine that these two dots of lights here are electrons. And if one electron is to imp uh, impact the presence of a second, it has to actually send a message carrier that tells the second object, I'm here, you're an electron, you need to move away from my location. So there's a message being conveyed. The message carrier here is, in fact, the photon. And so this is, in fact, a cartoon. But it's also a technical device that we physicists use called a Feynman diagram. From this diagram, I know how to write integral expressions to measure this force. Now, in the world of the very small quantum theory rules, and quantum theory tells us that, in fact, the story we just told was just the beginning of a much more complicated story. In this story, in this version, we have the two electrons. Again, one electron is trying to communicate to the second that you ought to be repelled. But in the process, it emits a photon, which it then reabsorbs, and then emits the second photon, which is the message carrier about the repulsion. It turns out that this is a different mathematical expression than the first. Or we could do this, where the uh, first electron sends out a, a photon which at this point disintegrates into a particle antiparticle pair, which we can imagine be a quark and positron, I'm sorry, an electron and positron. Since they have opposite charges, they attract to each other. They get to this point, they're antimatter, they destroy each other, just like in Star Trek. <laughs> creating a second photon, which is then absorbed by the second electron with the message, you ought to be repelled. So in the world of the quantum, the only thing you can say about an experiment is the initial points. Here we have two point electrons that are the initial part of the experiment. We observe two electrons at the end of the experiment, and in between something happened. And there are many, many versions of what the something is. And as you include more and more complicated versions of the pictures, you get greater and greater accuracy with respect to the quantum behavior of the system. This is simply perturbation theory. How successful is this? Because you might think, gee, that, that seems like a rather ad hoc means. And if any of you have ever studied uh, relativistic quantum field theory and had to face for the first time the burden of seeing what covariant relativistic quantum field theory looks like as formulated by Feynman, uh, it's shocking. It's brilliant, but it's totally shocking. I remember to this day being a graduate student understanding what it was that Feynman had put together for us. How good is it? Well. You know, physics is not a faith-based discipline. <laughs> now, many people uh, don't quite understand that. The thing that keeps us from being a faith-based uh, belief system is that at the end of the day, observation is what rules our paradigms. And this is a lesson that Einstein claims that Galileo drummed into us and therefore it makes Galileo the father not only of physics but of all of science, that observation rules the day. Pure thought alone cannot be the arbiter by which we come to understand nature. So there's uh, this uh, one property, there's this thing called the electron dipole moment, and then we've been measuring it for about 60 years, and we keep measuring it to greater and greater accuracy. Uh, when I was looking this up, this is the measurement. Well, since it's an experimental result, there's always some uncertainty of how well the equipment's working. 
And this number down here turns out to be hundreds and hundreds of Feynman diagrams, those complicated pictures that I showed you to calculate the same property. And as you can see, to the accuracy that is in the experimental setup, these two numbers agree. And so quantum mechanics, I like to call this the best known number in all of science because we have a theoretical prediction of this number to, to unprecedented accuracy. We have an experimental measurement of this number to incredible accuracy. And these two things agree to eight or 10 decimal places. There's no other number in science that I know that I can say this about. And so this gives us confidence that quantum theory is an accurate description of our reality. However, there are dangers in the quantum world. And one of these dangers are things we call anomalies. How does it work? Well, in the classical physics, we learn about conservation laws. So electrical current is conserved at the classical level. But if the laws of quantum mechanics are in force, is that, is that a true statement? But the answer turns out to be it doesn't have to be. In fact, in quantum theory, we, uh, we can draw graphs like this, where these lines here represent, for example, the motion of an electron. This is a photon coming in. And then in the interior of this, I'm sorry, the, these are gauge particles. In the interior of this, we have an electron running around a loop in the same kind of way of my animations. And if you calculate this diagram, it turns out you can get two different answers. Now, there's a very fun, famous story about this calculation. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it goes that the first person to figure this out was a graduate student. He was calculating this diagram. It was an assignment that his, grad, that his thesis advisor had given him. He did the calculation one way, he got one answer. And then he, to check it, he decided the calculation in a different way. He got a different answer. Well, you know, that sounds like there's a bug in your calculation somewhere. So you go back and you try to debug it. So he checked the calculations one way, got the same first answer. Checked the second way, got the same second answer. Then he took it to his advisor and said, I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. So then the advisor started looking at the calculation. And he checked all the calculations one way, they were just fine. Checked all the calculations the other way, it was just fine. And so the advisor was sort of scratching and says, I don't know what's going on here. The graduate student made the correct choice because he was uh, thinking about being a theorist. He chose to be an experimentalist. <laughs> <laughs> but this shows the dangers of anomalies. It cannot be that by simply performing a calculation in two different ways, you get two different answers. That's not consistent with how uh, the mathematics of physics works. And so it turns out that these things called anomalies can, in fact, destroy current conservation in, in the quantum realm. And you have to work very hard to make sure they don't occur. And in fact, uh, we can see, I have this cartoon illustration. Classically, it's like rolling a little ball down the side of a, the lip of a bowl. Classically, it's always, if you put it in the same place at the same time, it's always going to roll in exactly the same way. If you do this quantum mechanically, well, first of all, you can get particle production, so maybe more particles come out than you initially put there. And then instead of following the nice classical path, some of them decide to wander around because quantum mechanically, they are allowed to do that. <laughs> and then finally, some of them decide not to go down the bottom at all. That's the analog of breaking a current conservation law. And so anomalies, in principle, allow for this kind of behavior to go on. But if you do, then you have a theory with no predictive power. So what has to happen is you have to find ways to avoid anomalies. It turns out that in the standard model, this is done by the electrical charge assignments to the quarks and the electrons. It turns out if you look at the charge of the, of the up quark, it's one plus the charge on the down quark. If, and now if you actually plug in the charge on the electron, so this is two thirds, one third, yeah, two thirds and one third, well yeah, that part works. This is minus one because the charge on the electron is minus the charge on the, uh, minus the, charge on the proton. So you put a minus one here, you find out that this is indeed the number uh, four thirds. And so what happens is you avoid these funny triangle anomalies that would destroy the predictability of theory because the charges of the quarks and the charges of the leptons are exactly what you need to make sure that those triangle diagrams all cancel among themselves. So how did the hunt for the Higgs get started? And now we're going to do a little bit of heavy lifting. And I promise you that we won't be doing this the entire talk, but I want to take you through some of the rationale about why people think that the Higgs ought to exist and now how do we get there. We're going to start with an equation called the wave equation. I apologize for anyone in the audience who is feeling uncomfortable. Please don't bring out the holy water. <laughs> uh, the wave equation is a standard device that we physicists use to talk about extended media. And we can solve it by writing essentially what looks like a Fourier transform. Uh, you plug this into the wave equation, it tells you that this constant E here must be related to P and uh, through this equation. But then I, you recognize this perhaps is what Einstein teaches us is the relationship between energy and momentum for a photon. 
that's the equations that they obey. Uh, the Klein-Gordon equation is like the wave equation, but you put a mass term in. You can again try to substitute the Fourier series type solution, the Fourier transform, plug it into the differential equation. You find out the relationship between E and P and M is this, and of course this is Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. This is its origin terms of the equations that we physicists use. And for a plane wave moving along the uh, z-axis and cylindrical coordinates, let me s simply denote, uh, note that once the solution can be written in the bottom form. Well, the wave equation, in fact, and the uh, Klein-Gordon equation are, in fact, the same equation, except that in one case you have a potential equals zero, in the other case you have a potential that's non-zero. But they're in, otherwise they're the same equations. Well, we are, uh, uh, folks out here do a lot of stuff in the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you probably recall, uh, everything we know about electricity and magnetism comes to us from Maxwell, who actually first figured this out uh, in the 1860s, although the, his famous treatise wasn't written for a, about a decade afterwards. But um, Maxwell's equations, at, I'm teaching a course on electromagnetism right now uh, at uh, Maryland, and I like to point out that Maxwell's equations are the result of 40 or 50 years of, of work by lots and lots of physicists. The thing that Maxwell did, which was really cool, was that he added one term to the equations, namely this term called the displacement current, and then he gets credit for Coulomb's work and Beals of Art and all of those. <laughs> That's really cool, I think. But to me, uh, the, my, uh, to, to me the, the, uh, my favorite ter the term is this sign right here. I'm sorry, it's actually this sign here, which is called Lenz's Law. It just shows that if you had done physics early enough, you could put a correct sign in the equation, get a law of physics named after you. <laughs> so you take these equations that Maxwell gives us. Now the thing about Maxwell's equations, the electric and magnetic fields denoted by E and B are really like velocities in classical physics. And so just like or velocities have a, depend on position, the electromagnetic potentials, uh, fields actually depend on potentials, these things V and A. And now if you take these things and substitute them into the Maxwell's equation, you get another mathematical mess. And so, you know, you look at that and say, hmm, that doesn't look at all like how I got to Einstein's equation. But it would if I could get rid of this term right here. Then this would begin to look like the equation for Klein-Gordon. Turns out I can get rid of it. There's a property called gauge invariance that lets me set this combination to zero. And when I do that, then Maxwell equations look reduced to this form. If I set j and rho to zero, then this is exactly the form of the Klein-Gordon equations that I showed you two transparencies ago that lead to the famous equation e equals mc squared, except with uh, m equals zero. The photon uh, is a solution to these equations, and if you write out a plane wave solution moving along the z-axis, it ha actually has this form, which looks a lot like the Klein-Gordon equation except for this factor. And if we, let me point this out. So let me go back. I'm writing the standard, for those of you who know some electromagnetism, this is the standard plane wave solution for motion along the z-axis. But I've written it in cylindrical coordinates, not xy coordinates. And since it's written in cylindrical coordinates, the unit vector, uh, vectors are stars, unit vectors in the radial directions, and rings, unit directions in the angle directions. And so a photon, in some sense, looks like that. It's a bunch of stars and rings moving along an axis. But in fact, that funny dependence we saw there is in fact how you can tell the spin of a particle. For the Klein-Gordon equation, s was equal to zero. For the photon, this, is, this s is equal to one. But in fact, we know of other examples for this thing. In fact, the Dirac equation has s equal to half. The Einstein equation has s equal to two. And so in fact, if you write out a field equation and look for a plane wave solution and rewrite it in cylindrical coordinates, if you just get to this form, you can actually read the spin off by looking at the azimuthal angular dependence of the waveform. Something that I've never actually seen in a book, but you can all work it out for yourselves and prove it's true. So, suppose you want to have a massive photon. Well, one place might be to go back to Maxwell's equations and add a couple of terms. Proca did that. And so you follow the logic, and what you find is, once again, you get this horrible set of equations that doesn't look at all relativistic. But if you could apply this condition, it would, would be relativistic. Well, it turns out you can't, because Proca's equations don't are not invariant under this property. If they were invariant, you could write this. This is nice and relativistic. It would describe a photon that has a mass m. So there's some problems there. Now these problems, 
bedeviled particle physics back in the 50s. That's when people first realized these things around, that if you tried to write an equation for a massive photon, you would get into mathematical inconsistencies. And so for a long time, no one knew what to do. But then, through the work of Anderson, Brau, Anglier, Gauralnik, Hagen, Higgs, Kibble, and Tuft, uh, in other words, A, B, G, H, H, K, apostrophe, T, H, <laughs> These gentlemen found a solution for us, and Peter Higgs, who's one of the H's, is in fact the person who is the first person I know who's actually said, if you're going to give credit to this, give it to all of these folks, because they all played important roles. Anderson, by the way, didn't do it relativistically, he did it in a non-relativistic uh, context, but the rest of these folks who were uh, f the six winners of the Sakurai Prize in 2010 actually did all contribute to what we now call the Higgs mechanism. What's the idea? Well, first of all, the idea is just like you talk about electric and magnetic fields, in this context, you have to now think of something else in nature that's like an electromagnetic field. It's in a totally new object, but it has many similarities. We can introduce this thing, I like to call it the A, B, G, H, H, A, K, possibly T field. <laughs> and so we introduce this object. This is kind of like a potential that you would introduce for electromagnetism. And you break it up into three parts, one called the vacuum expectation value, another part called a Higgs boson, and a third part, which is called a Goldstone boson. And now you just take this thing and you shove it into an equation, and you ask, does this thing, is it consistent with the laws of special relativity? And the answer is, yeah, it will be most of the time. In fact, you can give yourself some latitude of putting plus and minus signs in. And when you do that, life gets really interesting, because those plus and minus signs basically control the shapes of potentials. In other words, think about this as a roller coaster. If you had a roller coaster uh, and you were sitting at this point in this ride and someone came along and says, okay, give me $10 to get in the car and then wait five minutes and then say, okay, your, your ride's over with, you probably wouldn't be very happy with that ride because if you're at the bottom of the potential, you're just gonna sit there. On the other hand, if you happen to get someone to put you at the top of this potential and someone just gives you a slight push then the car goes rolling down the roller coaster and up the other side, and gee, you get some fun. So you might be willing to pay $10 for that ride. Now, it turns out that these two functions, which are the difference between these plus and minus signs, if you put them in the equations, have dramatic effects. So first of all, again, uh, as I said, we're gonna get out of this math stuff in a moment, but I did wanna go through the entire discussion. If you pick the, if you work out the potential, you'll find out that it has one term which is independent of H, and then a term which is linearly dependent on H, and then H squared and H4 terms. The term that is independent of H is actually a problem. And the reason it's a problem because it would imply that elect electrical current is not conserved. So you have to make this term vanish. There are two ways of doing this. You can pick phi zero equals zero. That's for the uh, plus choice of the sign. Or you can pick phi zero squared equal to this combination in which the energy does have an H-dependent piece and energy is, and electricity, electrical current is conserved. So, a lot of math, what's the takeaway? Well, the takeaway can be taught in terms of pictures. The idea is that there's an energy surface that controls the behavior of something in our, in our universe called the Goldstone boson. When you put the Goldstone boson at the top of this energy surface, the fluctuations will mean that it won't stay there. So we'll roll down the side of this energy surface, and as it does, because it's coupled to the Z, uh, W and Z particles, they become massive. That's the Goldstone mechanism. It's a very simple story to tell in terms of pictures. A lot of mathematical backup, but that's the story. That's the thing that drives the discussion about the Higgs. Now let me go back a stage and remember that in order to get to that nice, simple story, we had to introduce something new in nature the Higgs boson, in the same way that the electric and magnetic fields have been introduced. Well, so far, let me go back to this picture just one more time. So far, I've explained to you that the Goldstone boson, which was that thing that was after the Higgs in my mathematical expression, is the object that gives mass to the force carriers. And in fact, uh, in uh, our world, we're going to actually need a more complicated kind of Goldstone boson. We need three of them, actually, because there's a W plus, a W minus, and a Z zero. Each one of them has to have a Goldstone boson in order to be massive. Um, so that explains mass for force carriers. 
but it doesn't explain mass for things like the electrons. So how do you get mass for electrons? Well, the analogy is, uh, if you are someone who works with magnets, you know that if I have a magnetic field pointed like this and I take a, a compass needle, the compass needle would want to align with the magnetic field through what we call a dipole interaction. And so the idea is, this thing, the Higgs field, is like an electric field or like a magnetic field. And so ordinary matter has an interaction energy in the presence of this thing. And it acts, in other words, it's this Higgs object causes ordinary matter to go from wanting to be massless to being massive. And all we do is we add an energy term to our equations, which depends on the Higgs field and the fermions. And then when the Higgs field rolls to the bottom of the potential, it leaves behind its vacuum value, so this becomes a number, and then this term here is exactly the mass term that you need for fermions. So what's the moral of the story? Well, it has three parts, so let's go back and review them. The mathematics says, introduce in nature this tripartite object, the vacuum value, the Higgs boson, and the Goldstone bosons. The Goldstone bosons are responsible for making force carriers become massive. The vacuum value of the Higgs is responsible for making fermions become massive, but they're all together in this nice compact form, and that is the Higgs mechanism. Okay, so that's how the, that's how the uh, uh, so we have this sort of fairy tale, which we can tell. Uh, we say that ordinary matter gets its mass by mo basically moving through a form of molasses that allegorically is this vacuum value that fills up all of space and through which all the other fermions move. So how do you find a needle in a haystack? Well, one way is to use computer simulations. It, one of the things about particle physics, which is often not understood, is how close is the interplay between the mathemat mathematics describing the processes and the experimental measurements of what's going on. Because it turns out that unless you know, a lot of people have the idea that doing science is like going on a safari. You know, you, you pay a lot of money, you get, you get on a, uh, some kind of a vehicle in the middle of the plains of Serengeti, you go looking and say, ah, there's this strange animal I've never seen before. A lot of people think that's how physics works. And for a lot of physics, that's actually right, because the building of the safari carrier is actually very sophisticated machinery, the type of, of devices that are developed here at NIST. They allow you to probe nature at smaller and smaller scales, thereby seeing things you couldn't see before. So it really is like going on a safari. But in particle physics, that's not the way it works. In particle physics, you have to know what it is that you're looking for in order to actually find it. And so that's why in my part of physics, theory is in fact input to doing the experiments. You actually have to figure out what kinds of signals do you need to, find, to uh, be looking for in order to verify or not a theory. Very different view, view of how to do physics. And so once you have the mathematics, you can set up computer simulations, saying if we did this, what kind of signals would we get? And that's what drives particle physics. There's an enormous, particle physics is broken up into three communities. The theorists, people like me who basically play around with all the bizarre mathematics. There are the experimentalists, those are folks who build the devices and do the measurements. And in between these communities are the phenomenologists. They're the people who take the mathematics and then turn out waveforms and signal forms and strengths of signals that will be measured by the experimentalists. And all three of these communities have to work in concert. So it's a very different way of doing physics than most people appreciate. Computer simulations are part of how we generate the signals that we expect to find. So such, here's a simulation uh, for uh, the compact muon solenoid, an event in the compact muon solenoid. We'll come later to describe that. Uh, this is a computer simulation that uh, one often sees online. Here's a different one. But again, these are all computer simulations. So you set up the computer so that they tell you what kinds of signals to be looking for. Uh, we tag particles. By that we mean when these collisions occur, the ways that the particles spray out uh, can be complicated and we can measure things like the energy deposition that they make or the uh, curvature of the path depending on magnetic fields. And we use those to tag the particles of what's being created. So here's a closer view where you can actually see some of the curvature. So if an object occurs one way, we know it's positively charged. If it occurs the other way, we know it's negatively charged. That's how we actually measure the charge on these things by the curvature of their paths and the presence of magnetic fields. So we tag them in this way, and then we can look for energy deposition inside of what are called calorimeters, which we'll come, from, come to in a moment. So now we go to the Large Hadron Collider. I like to call it the world's only Higgs knowledge factory. It's the only place on the planet Earth that you can go to learn about the Higgs particle. 
At this point, I probably uh, want to hang my head in a little bit of uh, distress because about just over a decade ago, my community went to the rest of you folks and said that we'd like to have a few dollars. It's, you know, it's like your teenage son saying, Dad, can I have the car? We said, we'd like to have a few dollars to build this thing called the Superconducting Super Collider. It was a, an accelerator that would have been built in Waxahachie, Texas. It would have been three times as powerful as the LHC, which is now functioning. And it was not built. It became what I call the perfect government project. A couple of billion dollars were spent to dig a hole, and then the hole was covered up. <laughs> well, that's not quite what happened, because a lot of the technology that would have gone in the SSC is actually at the LHC working right now. So for example, the superconducting magnets that make the LHC go, those were actually developed for the SSC. A lot of the detector equipment, uh, in, both in the CMS as well as the Atlas, those were actually developed for the SSC. So it's not quite right to say that we spent a billion dollars and got nothing for it because we did get the technology, which in fact is allowing us to, to pursue this physics now. So if you flew over Geneva, about 30,000 feet, you see something like this. There are the Alps in the background, here's Lake Geneva, but you wouldn't see this red circle. We put that there to guide your eye for the location of the Large Hadron Collider. The ha Large Hadron Collider is in fact in a tunnel under, this, uh, under the city of Geneva, crossing the borders between Switzerland and France. And in this tunnel, there are a number of uh, devices, the uh, ATLAS device and the CMS device we will be concentrating on, because those are the devices that over 6,000 of your, uh, over 6,000 physicists work on, large numbers of them being Americans. That's the American contribution to the LHC physics. In fact, without this contribution, it is unlikely that we would have been able to see the Higgs. So even though the accelerator is not on our shores, our technology and our expertise and manpower are in fact driving this project to a large degree. There are other experiments in there such as ALICE and LHCB where people are measuring different things like the, uh, what's called the uh, Kabibo angles for certain of the hadrons. But these two detectors are the main detectors that work at the LHC. So how does the Higgs production factory work? Well, it's a proton-proton synchrotron. We have some cartoons to illustrate that. Generates beams, it was designed at least for to generate beams of up to 70 EV per beam. And it's a 27 kilometer in circumference at a depth between 50 and 150 meters underground. And it's not that the device is tilted, it's that the ground tilts going towards the Alps. The device is actually level, but the ground tilts as you go towards the Alps, so it's taller at one end than the other. Here's a cartoon. In the uh, LHC, we pre have uh, several pre-acceleration places where we take protons and we accelerate them using electric fields until they're moving 0.9999999 the speed of light, faster than anything we've ever made move on this planet. And then we use magnets to bend them circular paths. We release the protons into this larger ring. And around the larger ring, as we will just see in a moment, there are, there's the tunnel with a pipeline. There are actually two pipes that carry the protons. And now we're inside one of those pipes. In a moment, we're going to see four or five protons run past us, those little pink balls. In reality, the number of protons that would be passing you is like 10 to the 11. So this is just an illustration so you get an idea of what's going on. And so we allow these two beams to meet at places. And this is the cartoon of the CMS detector. And in the interaction regions, we let these protons run right head into each other, and we get collisions. And we watch what happens after that. Now, it's not this dramatic. <laughs> but I've taken a little bit of poetic license. And the point is, there's a very violent events occurring in the interior of these devices. These devices are basically large cameras. They're the fastest, most sensitive cameras we've ever made. And they take pictures of what's going on. So here's the actual inside the tunnel uh, at the LHC. Uh, a number of you have probably seen this photograph. Uh, here's another view. And this is my favorite view because it actually shows what's going on. These two bright lights here are, in fact, the beams of protons circulating in counter circular fashion around the beam. There's an outer layer which, uh, there are several outer layers. One of them is a thermal layer. We also have a shrink layer because the magnets are superconducting, so therefore they have to be kept very cool in order to be able to bend the beams. Uh, the actual beams you see here, uh, there's a vacuum chamber. We pump the air out because you don't want uh, straight air molecules where the beams is because you'll, de you'll degrade your beam pretty rapidly. And so it's a really high-tech operation to get the, the machine to work. And so it collides the protons. Why are we colliding protons? Because we want this to happen. 
If you collide protons, remember protons are held in the interior of matter by these things called gluons, these force carriers for this uh, chromodynamic force. When you collide protons together, you can cause gluons to fuse. And out of gluon fusion, because it's a highly energetic state, it will decay. And typically, it will decay into one of these triangle type of diagrams that we talked earlier uh, being the source of anomalies. Now, it turns out that QCD by itself doesn't have anomalies. And so these triangle graphs are perfectly fine in the context of strong interaction physics. A Higgs particle can be produced at this vertex. And the Higgs particle is a highly excited state, and therefore it rapidly decays. One of its decay mode is into what we call a top quark uh, W uh, boson loop. Again, something that looks like a um, uh, here, I mean W quark or a W boson loop, something that either has a top quark flowing around it or a W boson flowing around it. But this thing, uh, being a triangle diagram, can output two photons. And we can measure photons. We're good at that kind of stuff. And so you run the computer simulations to tell you what kind of patterns of photons are generated by this process, and then you go look to see if you can find those kinds of patterns. Here's another process that comes out of gluon fusion. Again, you create the Higgs boson by first colliding the protons, getting gluon fusion, which then goes into a triangle graph. And this time, the Higgs boson decays into a, a, the Z particle, not the W. And then from the Z, you can get the decays of four leptons. And so you now go to look at highly correlated four lepton beams that are coming out of the spray. This machine is an amazing machine. Its performance has uh, actually astounded many of us because normally when you build a device this complicated, there's always, I mean, I don't tell you folks here because many of you work in the laboratories, you know how hard it is to actually get devices to do what you want them to do. This machine has the typical sort of same difficulties and yet it has been functioning amazingly well. These are some performance uh, figures that I was able to get from friends uh, who are part of the CMS collaboration. At the end, I'm going to acknowledge that. Um, but this is data of, of, of the performance on the machine from the period of 2010 uh, through 2011, uh, where we're showing intensity of beams. I'm sorry, luminosity of beams, which basically means the bunching of protons. How bright is the beam? Brightness here means how many protons do you have in the beam, as well as the efficiency of the devices to capture them. As you can see, the capture region is shown here in orange. The blue region is actually the output from the beam. As you can see, it's functioning greater than the 90% efficiency of the capture of these beams in the two devices. So as I said, the detectors were made here. Well, that's not quite right. The technology was developed here. We assembled it all there in Geneva. Uh, there are large groups of American physicists that do this. One of our detectors is called the compact muon solenoid. It's, this card is a cartoon. Uh, this is to scale, that's a person. So you can get some sense of the size of the operation from this cartoon. In a similar manner, here's a real picture under, uh, when the device was in the construction. There's a technician with a lab coat and brown pants standing there. So you can see what it looks like. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Amons, Angels and Demons uh, that came out a few years ago. But if you remember that movie, there was uh, this scientific establishment where these evil forces were trying to get antimatter. That scientific establishment was actually modeled on CERN. And in fact, the producers, uh, when they were trying to figure out what kind of visuals to make for the movie, were actually taken to CERN. And they were totally blown away because they had thought that you know, there was some magnificent machinery, but they had no idea that it already existed in our reality. And so they had to catch up. <laughs> so they had to catch up in their movie for what was already going on in the laboratory. This is the Atlas Collider. Uh, Atlas, I love the acronym Atlas. Atoroidal LHC Apparatus. <laughs> God, was somebody going for a stretch on that name. <laughs> but that's actually what it stands for. Again, to scale, you can see two individuals to scale here. And here's the device. Here, this time we talk about some of the machinery, so we have calorimeters. Those are the things that look at the energy deposit of the beams as they come out of the interaction region. Uh, muon detectors, muons are... Uh, particles that often get produced in such uh, things. And then we have various other tractors, uh, trackers. And then magnets, of course, that help us bend the beam. So that's how the technology works. And that's a real picture of Atlas. Again, you see our obligatory uh, technician during assembly, this time with a brown vest and brown pants, hard hat on. And then last, 4th of July, up until the 4th of July, people like me would run around and say, this is our table of elements. You know the table of elements, H on one side, H on the other, and then you go through the list invented by Mendeleev. Every high school student mostly encounters this thing. Not too many high school students encounter this version of it. 
This is the newest table of elements. We've been spending a couple of trillion dollars for about over a couple of decades to get this information. This tells us how you put atoms together. So to put an atom together, you need electrons, and then to get protons, you need to have up and down quarks in those little bags that I talked about. So this is the parts list for the table of elements. But on the 4th of July last, a new bit was added to this parts list. The announcement of the Higgs boson. Uh, the LHC collaboration loudly announced to the world. They flew Peter Higgs from England to be there in Geneva. And there was a, a, a festive spirit. It was online. You could share. And the story came out that the evidence for this thing that started off as this H symbol in this piece of mathematics and that Rube Goldberg that I told you about to put mass in that this thing had progressed from the mathematical storytelling to being something seen in the laboratory. That's the arc of the story. The Higgs boson is the first fundamental particle that doesn't spin at all. So if you had quarks or electrons, they act like little spinning balls. The Higgs particle doesn't spin. It has spin zero, the first fundamental object with no spin whatsoever. We can tell that because because of the decay patterns. If you look at the Higgs boson, when it decays into a w, uh, a w plus and a W minus, the Higgs boson being neutral, you can look at the predominance of the direction of the spin of the W versus its momentum. And for the Higgs particle, you'll find out that the momentum vector for one of the outgoing Ws lines up with its spin vector, and that the momentum vector for the other W lines up with its uh, spin vector. And so that's what tells you that this thing was spin zero. On the other hand, if you watch the W's decay, because the W's all themselves decay, they will output an electron and, uh, an electron and uh, a neutrino. And what you find is that the spins for the electron is counter to the direction of motion, whereas the spin for the neutrino is lined up, or vice versa. So that's how we know about the spin of the Higgs particle, by looking at the alignments of the spins of the decay products versus their directions of motion. So, I, after I saw this announcement last summer, I sort of wiped my forehead and said, Whew, I've now seen item one on my bucket list. <laughs> you see, um, there was this movie called The Bucket List uh, starring um, uh, Morgan Freeman and Jean Jack Nicholson, thank you about these two guys that were dying, and they had this list of things they wanted to see before, or do before they died. And um, although I'm sometimes mistaken for Morgan Freeman, I'm not. <laughs> I'll have to tell you folks some of those Morgan Freeman stories, because in fact, the last one happened two weeks ago when I was on my way to South Africa. It's very bizarre. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, as a theorist, there are things I would like to see before I leave this mortal coil. This is my list, and now I got to put in red one of the items. I'd like to see gravity waves. I mean, you know, our country's spending several hundred million dollars uh, to, to have developed the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's in, located in two places, in Johnston Parish in Louisiana, as well as the old Hanford Reservation in the state of Washington. And the purposes of those devices are to detect waves of gravity, something we've never seen. Again, something that up until this point, we only know these things because the mathematics says that gravity can behave like a wave. So again, it's the mathematics leading you to go look for something. Uh, I'd like to see super partners, and we'll come to this, and then finally, super string M theory. Like, boy, I'd love to see that before I, I quit this coil. Probably ain't gonna happen. <laughs> How sure are we of this discovery? Well, um, the way we uh, particle physicists do it, and the way most physicists do it, is to talk about uncertainties, and we have this uh, figure of merit called sigma. And a particle physics uh, discovery is typically at the five sigma level. You can see the various levels. Three sigma represents about the same likelihood of tossing eight heads in a row. Uh, uh, five sigma is like uh, one in a million opportunities. So we, that's the gold standard of discovery in the field. You want to get to a five a sigma deviation. Uh, let me speed up here. So what are the data telling us? So if you look at the, and again, uh, I had a friend in CMS help me with this talk, so if we look at the data, what, we've, what we can find is actually that we can produce Higgs particles at the LAC and watch numbers of decay uh, channels. So some of the decays are actually drawn here in terms of uh, Feynman diagrams. You can watch Higgs go to two gamma. You can watch Higgs go into two bottom quarks. You can watch Higgs go into uh, 
tau particles. You can watch Higgs go into W, you can watch Higgs go into Z. And so these are different channels. For each of these, we have figured out what the signals look like for a Higgs decay. We build the devices and then go look for those patterns. And you do that, and what you find out is that we, if we, for example, look at the Higgs to 2 gamma channel, you find out that uh, uh, we find very definite signals at about 125. That's why we're saying that there's a Higgs particle at 125 GeV over C squared. Uh, this thing here is rather interesting, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me just move ahead. Uh, you can also look, ask questions about decay channels because we, we think we're good enough to be able to figure out, as you look at the, all the possibilities of decays, um, how do they line up in terms of mass. And what we find in, the, in the CMS data is actually something rather interesting. If you look at Higgs to, two, to bottom, you look at Higgs to tau, you look at Higgs to W and Higgs to Z, and you get, a, and this green, by the way, is the uncertainty, you can see that the mass is pretty much lining up on all of those different channels. On the other hand, if you look at Higgs to 2 gamma, the uncertainty here is actually in red, and as you can see, it's lying outside. So there may actually be something very strange going on. In fact, when you, if you're someone like me and you heard that announcement last July 30th, uh, the 4th of July, you got very suspicious. Because the language, they were, there were a lot of weasel words in the, in the language. They were saying Higgs-like. I mean, you can go back and look at the answer. You can find the expression Higgs-like, which, you know, that's not the way we talk. We don't say electron-like. It's either electron or it's not, right? You don't say Higgs-like. What is that? And so at the time, there was data to say, suggest that we had found something at a certain mass. We didn't know whether it was spin zero then, by the way. We do now, with the latest announcements of the data, we have firmly established that it is spin zero. Um, but are we there yet? The answer turns out, no, we're not. This is an announcement that was sent out by Rolf Heuer, the uh, uh, director of CERN, uh, on the 14th of March. And I emphasize in red this part of his statement, or possibly the lightest of several bosons. You see, it's not completely clear what is going on at the LHC with the Higgs announcement. I alluded to this a little bit by showing you this data. You'll notice there's a, a dip there. Now this is only at the two sigma level, and if you look at the history of particle physics, we're notorious. I mean, bumps come and go in our field, and until you get them to, you take more and more data to assure yourself that you're actually seeing a real signal, you don't really know. But uh, this uh, particular bump here has lived through two data releases of both collaborations, and both of them <laughs> seem to see it. Um, so we're not there yet. But does that mean that there's more than one Higgs? And why would there be more than one Higgs? The answer turns out to be symmetry. Uh, in 1977, I wrote, uh, as, uh, was kind of, as uh, Bill was kind enough to mention in the introduction, I wrote the first thesis at uh, MIT on the subject of supersymmetry. But that's actually only half the thesis. The first half of the thesis is actually looking at weak interaction physics, and in particular Higgs physics. And so I was one of the first people at MIT, at least, to look at the possibility that in nature there might be more than one Higgs. So how does that actually occur? Well, it occurs because, remember, when I took the wave functions, I just put them together in what looked like a willy-nilly pattern. And in particular, I had, the, uh, I had the electron and its neutrino in one little doublet, and then I had the muon and its neutrino in an entirely separate doublet. But suppose they were part of a bigger object. If they were part of a bigger object, this begins to look, look more like quarks. You move this way and you change the electrical charge, in the, of the particles, but if you move this way, you would change what's called family number. If these were quarks, this is the color direction of motion. You change the color of quarks as you move along this axis. No one could tell you not to try that idea for leptons. And so, in fact, in my thesis, is based on a model by, De uh, by uh, Teplitz, Dicus, and Young. I wound up in 1977 studying this model and looking at the spectrum of its Higgs particles. And what the model shows is that you can have more Higgs particles than the one that is the well-accepted one. But it m means that the patterns in which you assemble the particles are bigger than the assumptions that we made in the standard model. So yeah, you can actually get more Higgses, and it's relatively simple. There's another way to do it. 
If the extra bumps remain after the analysis, then the post-standard model era will have begun. A rich spectrum of Higgs-like fields will be avatars of the existence of symmetries beyond those in the standard model. So if you've seen the letters SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, we may have to start adding more letters and numbers. That's what the, the first thing I told you. But it might even, to me, be more exciting because it might be that we are beginning to see the evidence of supersymmetry. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, I'm going to sibyl the universe for you. So here we are. We've got, uh, here's our universe. I even included the graviton here, or rather here. And now these are super partners. These are forms of matter and energy that, in fact, excited me as a graduate student. The reason I wound up writing the first thesis at MIT in 1977 at MIT on this subject is I read the research papers, and I realized that I was alive at a time when people were saying new forms of matter and energy could exist. And I got so excited. I ran around the Center for Theoretical Physics like someone with their head on fire, trying to get someone to help me learn this stuff. And there was no one in the center at all that knew anything about supersymmetry. So I wound up teaching myself the subject and in the process, writing a PhD thesis. I, um, there was an added benefit for writing that thesis because when I uh, defended that thesis, I knew more about what was in it than anybody in the room. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, who I work with these days, a guy by the name of Ernie Moniz, who just became Secretary of Energy, was on my thesis defense committee. And a few years ago, I, I asked him a question to check my memory of how, dis how wonderful my thesis defense had been. I said, Ernie, do you remember what you told me after the defense? And he said, yeah. That was the best thesis defense I had ever seen. But I always thought, gee, uh, they don't know about the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> For those of you who are Star Trek fans, you know that uh, James Tiberius Kirk passed the computer chest test by changing the code the night before the exam was taken. That's what I had done in my PhD thesis defense, because I wrote that code. So these super partners, well, are they there? We don't know. But why would they say more Higgses? Well, first of all, the super partners, well, quarks have super partner quarks. Neutrino will have a superpartner neutrino. The electron will have a superpartner electron. The muon has a superpartner muon. The tau particle has a superpartner tau. Uh, the z particle has a superpartner zeno. The photon has a superpartner called the photino. The gluons have superpartners. For every one of these, are uh, gluinos. My favorite superpartner is actually this one right here. <laughs> I can't wait. I would love to see a headline splashed across the newspaper. W-I-N-O, seen in Geneva. Most people would think that you're talking about some kind of alcoholic specialist, but we would know that it's a super partner that had been seen. But the thing that is really weird about this, about the supersymmetric extension of standard model is that it actually has five Higgs particles, not one. So if we are seeing more Higgs particles, if we're beginning to see them, then that could in fact be the first sign not that we're seeing the superpartners, but we're seeing the extra Higgses that the mathematics of supersymmetry actually demands. And so, supersymmetry, why does it need more than one Higgs? Well, remember I told you about the triangle anomalies that can occur, and that the quark charges and the uh, quarks, up and down quarks and the associated family of leptons had to have their charges in exactly the right pattern to not lead to mathematical inconsistencies? It turns out in the supersymmetrical models, you need more Higgses to avoid the mathematical inconsistencies of the model, which is much more different than finding an accidental symmetry.